No worries. Hey. hey everyone. What a great venue. I mean, I, I mean, I don't believe in ghosts and things like that, but even when he said about shadows, I, I felt it. Uh, I felt a little bit uncomfortable. I was going to put my jacket on. Um, but yeah, thank you for having me. It's great, it's great to be here. And um, um, yeah, so like you said, I'm Steve and I'm the events and uh, experiences lead at Cooper Parry. Um, and I create spaces that Cooper Parry's kind of people want to hang out in. And that's, that's what I do. So whether I'm doing a podcast, um, a live event, an online event, something in between, um, I try and create something that those people can get into. And that's my closest thing really to creativity because I know in the room there's lots of good business people and creative people. So I'm gonna try and hold my own. Now I work with a lot of hosts and speakers and I know from working with those guys that I should exude some kind of confidence and ease you all in and reassure you that everything I'm gonna do is gonna be okay. But I'm normally behind the camera, not in front of it. Um, so I'm gonna try and do my best for you today to talk about depth. I don't have access to IT, so I won't be able to uh, wow you with tech and I've gotta try and keep you uh, engaged with my conversation and I'll certainly try and do my best. So when I was asked to talk about depth, I had a little uh, chuckle to myself um, because I can come across as uh, quite shallow on, uh, on um, first impressions. Um, in fact, when I was in the Navy, my first boss wrote in his opening paragraph of my annual report, Whittle would be out of his depths in a car park puddle. <laughs> so that was a bit harsh. That was very harsh. Um, but whenever I think about depth, I always think about how deep something is. So I became obsessed when I was getting ready for this about deep things right, as opposed to depth. And that's where I'm gonna go a little bit. But I've got a goal that I wanted to try and get out of today. That's what I'm always trying to do. I'm always talking about goals. And my goal today is to give you something that you can create at no cost other than your time, which could save someone's life. That's kind of a big goal, okay? Something that I can help you create that could save someone's life. Now, I don't consider myself a creative person, even though I've just said that I create events. I mean, I can't write, can't draw. My girlfriend will testify that I am great at creating a mess. Um, but coming to talk to you, all you guys, knowing how talented and creative you are, I knew I had to do something a little bit left field. And I think when this went out on LinkedIn, someone did say, um, Steve's probably going to do something out of the box. Um, yeah, and they were right. However, I am a little shallow at times, and we know that. So I just Googled deep things. I thought maybe that'll inspire me to come up with some stuff. So I did, Google deep things and I found some amazing stuff, right? So I'm gonna share with you my three, the three favorite things before I go into the main talk. Um, the first thing that comes up are deep thoughts. Now these are amazing. Have anyone seen shower thoughts are very similar to that. So in deep thoughts, my three favorites, which blew my mind are, I wonder what my dog named me. <laughs> I bet beautiful people think the world is much more polite than it is. No, no, you're thinking about that one? And then my favorite one, thanks to the word indescribable, there's nothing that cannot be described. <laughs> right, okay. There was also about 40 pages dedicated to how deep God is with a, um, a, a reoccurring question of um, in order, family, career or love life, how would you rank those? Now, I didn't think that was that deep because there was no mention of sports or my Harley Davidson. Um, so I couldn't rank any of those. But who would like to hazard a guess on what the deepest thing is on the first page of Google? Probably the ocean. Very close. Mariana Trench, okay, is the deepest thing, right? Seven miles deep, that's quite deep, depth, right? But for those of you who like it in other, uh, other ways, 11,000 meters or 36,000 feet-ish, okay? But that's not the most, that's not the best thing I read about the Mariana Trench. The best thing I read about the Mariana Trench in the deepest place is that there's a fish um, called the angler fish. Anyone seen this? Yeah. Ugly. <laughs> yes, I'm never gonna meet one, so I can call it ugly, right? It's not gonna offend him. <laughs> Right? But the most interesting thing about the anglerfish is it's got that thing that sticks out of its head with a light on the top, and every time any prey comes anywhere near the light, it's drawn to the light, they eat it, right? Females are eight inches long. That's not eight inches, okay? <laughs> uh, eight inches long, right? The males are only an inch long. Now the male's life cycle at some point is going to merge with the eight inch fish to make one fish. 
Bonkers. I got lost on Google, by the way, so about four or five hours <laughs> looking for deep things. Okay, but that's not why we're here, all right? So we're talking about depth and I'm focusing on deep things, all right? Because like every man on the planet, whenever they go to the beach, men and boys, we just see how deep we can dig a hole because that's all we really care about. We don't want to build sandcastles, we just want to see about deep things. So I want to talk about deep things in business because we're all in business. And in business, um, we'd all get stuck if we didn't do a deep dive in the decisions that we make uh, in business. I said earlier uh, that I create spaces um, that people in business want to hang out in, and we must listen to the event owner. We need to dig deep with the event owner to find out exactly what we need to do. So I've got an example of you of when I thought I'd hit all the goals for an event owner, but it fell completely on its face because I didn't dig deep. Um, I was asked to deliver a culture event for entrepreneurs, not the culture carnival, which I think some people know about, but a culture event about three years ago in London. Now, the event owner was so excited about this event, and he gave me some goals. He said, I want 100 to 120 people in the room. I want a business event for networking. We've got this amazing speaker who's going to talk about culture and how culture is the driving force for the business success. Okay, so fill the room and then give them something to really remember. I was like, fantastic, I can do that. I can absolutely do that. So I went all out. And along with my great guest speaker, who will remain anonymous because I don't want him associated with this, we, uh, we filled the room with 100 guests. We had culture food stands from around the world. We had culture cocktails and flaring barmen. We ha even had culture club. I had a culture club tribute wow. band, right? Well, I say band, we had Boy George. I'd run out of budget, okay? So we had Boy George, right? It was fantastic. So halfway through the event, I am now looking over the event, admiring my work. I saw that the CEO was uh, stood there and he had his own arms folded and he looked a bit grumpy. So I walked across whilst listening to Karma Chameleon, <laughs> all right, eating about seven different nations dishes on my plate. And I said, um, hey boss, um, how do you think we're doing? I was assured that he was gonna shower me with um, positivity about what a great job I'd done. He said, it's okay, shame the wrong people are in the room. Uh, come again? He went, yeah, yeah, the event's okay, but um, I've checked the guest list. There's nobody on the guest list I want to talk to. Um, this is not going to make the Cooper Parry boat go faster. Now, he's a really nice guy. I've painted him in a bit of a bad picture there, but he is really focused. And he was bang on. He was absolutely right. Okay. So I was like, what the flip? This can't be happening. So I went over to the event owner and said, hey, how do you think the event's going? And he went, it's brilliant. Best event I've ever been to. Karma Chameleon still playing in the background. Great food, flaring barman, great speaker, room full. I've hit all my goals. So we wrapped up the event. So when I wrapped up the event, he was right. For as good as the event was, okay, it wasn't right for the business. I'd missed some valuable points. So what did I learn? I needed to dig deeper. I need to find out who was ultimately signing off on the event. I need to find out why we were putting it on. What did we want to get out of it? And agree the goals with the right person and then keep checking those goals as well. I need to be braver. I need to ask more questions and learn about what the business needs were to get out of that. So I just needed to ask more questions. And then that is how you make the boat go faster. So I always have to dig it deeper to find out how we need to make the boat go faster. Having, having said that now, he's not complained about any more of my events and I've been there four years. So um, I wanna talk about getting deep with people. So I said earlier that I was shallow and that's how I, I come across in a lot of uh, first impressions. I like to make a joke about everything, you know. Um, I told you about my boss in the Navy who said I was out of my depth in a car park puddle. And I thought that was really relevant uh, because there was probably a reason why he said that. Okay, apart from the fact that he was, all, he was a bit of an ass, all right? But he was my boss and that's how he saw me. So had he dug a little bit deeper into my performance, he would have realized that I was keen to please and a team player. When asked if I could do something back then, I would always say yes. I would learn how to do it as I was going 
and I would work really hard to make it work. Okay, so Richard Branson once famously said, if you don't know how to do something, but you want to do it, all right, just do it anyway and learn on the job. Now, I didn't know Richard Branson back then or of him, okay, that wasn't what I was doing. I just wanted to get things right. Nine times out of 10, it would work. I'd figure it out, get it done, and make it work. But sometimes I would fall on my face. And we often only remember the times when people fall on their face, okay? So bad news always travels quicker than good news. So he would only ever remember those bad times. So what did I learn from that? Well, you need to dig deep with people. You need to find out why somebody keeps um, failing. And in my case, help them understand their limitations and support them to get development they need to do the task. I learned in the Navy that one volunteer is worth 10 pressed men. So if you focus on the volunteer's limitations, they'll soon exceed your expectations. So we need to dig deeper with people. So let's go back to how I can try and help you create something that can help save a life. So I'm going to go really deep now, okay? But I promise I'm going to try and bring this up. I want to share with you a deep and personal story that comes with a trigger warning. And I'm going to try and finish on a high note. As an adult, I was diagnosed with ADHD and bipolar disorder and I wish I'd realized it and sought help sooner. It's fair to say that I've always had mental health problems, but in 2021, it was a terrible year and it culminated in my decision to take my own life. In 2021, my life hit its peak. I have a great relationship, a fantastic job, and a great circle of friends. Even so, every day I felt like I was contributing, I was not contributing to those people around me and I regularly suffered anxiety, which sometimes resulted in panic attacks. For months, I thought, I, uh, thought of completing suicide. I had planned it out in my head. I thought of everything from the apology note uh, to, how I was gonna make my, uh, to how I was gonna make it as fine as possible. It was important to me not to survive the attempt and become a further burden. I suppose um, it didn't help that I'd been signposting Dave the chef uh, at Cooper Parry uh, to help him with his mental health problems and I was keeping in regular contact with him. I'm a mental health first aider and I was devastated to hear that um, he'd taken his life while I was on holiday. I wondered if I had been around, we could have had enough contact to help him recognize his value uh, to all of us. I was sat in my home office thinking about um, all the people I have to apologize to when I die. I opened up a Word document on my computer and I started bullet pointing the people I needed to say sorry to. First, I put down the train driver who had no idea I was about to ruin his day. I put down my girlfriend, my mum, my son, and the list went on. After a while, I stopped putting reasons and just started putting names. And it was at that moment I saw a list of people whose life I had made worse by being in it. I'd let them all down, not filled my potential, and they would all be better off without me. I set my computer not to shut down. I left an apology note on the screen. I left the house and I walked to the train crossing about 10 minutes from the house. There was one right next to my house, but I didn't want to go there because it's busy. And I knew that people would try and stop me. I stood leaning on the gate that leads out to the train track and next to the train, um, sorry. I stood leaning on the gate that leads to the train tracks and waited for the next train and going over in my head what I needed to do to make sure this worked. It was all about timing. I didn't want to come out too soon and the driver put the brakes on. I didn't want to come out too late uh, and not make it under the train. This needed to be final. Some children started playing on the opposite side of the tracks, on the opposite side of the gate. Um, they saw me, I saw them, we made eye contact, but they carried on playing. Uh, the train was coming and I got myself ready. I was confident this was the right thing to do. So as the train was approaching, the children saw it too. They climbed up on the gate opposite and one of them got their phone, mobile phone out to film the train coming past. I got ready, I was confident, and I was gonna come out. I started to think how this would affect them, watching me throw myself under this train. The train reached a stepping out point. I looked at the kids. I didn't step out, and I'm not sure why I hesitated. But it was okay. I missed my opportunity and I knew it was gonna be okay because the kids would soon go and there'd be another train along in a second. 
Eventually I was alone waiting for the next train. I was thinking about how I would have affected the children, how a video of my suicide would affect my girlfriend and my family. I started to feel guilty and this only added to the list of why everyone was better off without me. I began to think about the chef at work, a hugely popular figure who had recently did exactly the same thing that I was planning and what must have been like for his family to find out that he took his life when he, because he knew he felt undervalued. Feeling out of control and sick, I started with a panic attack. I started to lose control again. I thought, I'll walk this off, I'll control my breathing, and then I'll come back. By the time I felt some level of control, I was back at home, sat in my office, looking at my list of people. I felt, humi I felt humiliated and a failure. Look at me, back home, I can't even manage to kill myself. This feeling was made worse because this wasn't the first time um, that I had failed. A while had passed, and I had a moment of clarity. I don't know why I had this clarity, but I contacted the NHS support line and told them what had just happened. They were sympathetic without being patronizing. They put me onto a therapist straight away and they asked me lots of questions. They kept me on the phone for ages, making sure that I wasn't um, gonna be any more danger to myself that day. They talked me for a long time and they wouldn't hang up until they were convinced I would be okay. I was given some advice um, to let those closest to me to know what I was going through and that they could support me. I agreed, but I knew there was no way I was going to do that. I felt humiliated and that I'd let myself down to get in such a bad way and that I needed to ask for help. The last thing I needed was for those around me to see how weak and pathetic I had become. I know that I could do this with the help of strangers without burdening those people closest to me. So the NHS gave me uh, emergency counselling, but it had been assessed quite quickly that I needed trauma counselling, which could take up to six months to get. After a few sessions, the counsellor said that they were discharging me and I needed to wait for trauma counselling. It's just a sad state of affairs that there is not enough counsellors for the number of people needing urgent help. I hit a new low in February um, as my work started to suffer. Mel, my boss, had picked up on this, and rightly so, and she arranged a meeting for a chat. I interpreted this as, I'm about to get fired. I tried to preempt the conversation in the meeting and uh, headed Mel off by recognizing my failures, explaining that I could turn things around. Mel let me burn myself out and waited for me to stop. She told me that she didn't care about my work. She wanted, to know, she wanted me to know that she had noticed a significant change in my behavior. My outlook and my attitude had changed and people were worried about me. Of course, I reacted defensively to this um, because I, you know, and I tried to play it down, but brilliantly, Mel let me talk myself out again. She reassured me that everything was okay and I shouldn't worry about my work. Mel explained that um, she was worried about me and uh, her primary concern and the business primary concern was my well-being. She said it was okay to talk to her about what had happened or not talk to her. But if I did, she wouldn't judge me and she would just listen. I'm not sure um, how I actually told Mel what was going on. My memory's a little bit blurred. Um, but I do remember I just rattled out my problems and my suicide uh, attempt like a machine gun. I felt so vulnerable and I was sure she was going to brush me off, maybe even laugh at me and tell me to pull my socks up. We had a great conversation and Mel showed incredible empathy. She helped me develop a plan for my next steps. I agreed to speak to my girlfriend that night about my feelings and my suicide attempt, take some leave, book in with the GP immediately. Mel asked me if she could share what I was going through with HR. I agreed, but I was worried. Uh, and this was a turning point for me. I'd finally found the strength to talk um, through the persistence of someone willing to listen and not judge me. There's a little bit of an important side note here for people who really care about me who, who might see this. I, I'm a little bit worried that, of course, there are people who are closer to me than Mel, like my girlfriend, um, who would have reacted the same way as Mel, but I would never have willingly opened up to them as I've always my, seen myself as a, as a man and as a protector. And there's a real stigma that we all need to work harder to you know, um, change and destroy. 
Now, my GP and I agreed that I would take medication and wait for trauma counseling. Through CP, I started trauma coaching through Sanctus. I was dubious about sharing my issues with strangers, but it was life-changing and terrifying all at the same time. Um, I also had three months off work to get my uh, shizzle together. So how am I now? Well, I'm in a much better place. I have a structure uh, to help me manage my mental health. I've not been let go by CP, so I can only assume my work has um, not been affected. I, I have a healthy relationship with myself and those around me. I have a passion to be, not become unwell again. I do have days where I'm not top banana. And I know the best thing to do is to talk to those people closest to me. I use protocols that I've learned through coaching and, and I trust the process. Now I've made this sound quite easy, but it's not. Every day um, is a struggle to stay on track and not feel those things. It's, in it's incredibly difficult to talk about things when I'm having a bad day. It isn't easy for anyone suffering. And I hope that you find the strength to talk like I eventually did um, if you are struggling. So what can we learn from this story? Now we went really deep there and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you understand why I shared that. But the hero of this story was Mel. And those people who are brave enough to create spaces that allow people to talk free from judgment. Please dig deep and not accept that they are okay uh, when they are not. Help them find the strength to seek help. You may not be the person that they open up to in the end, but if enough people create enough spaces and enough opportunities, we'll all help people steer away from completing suicide. I am going to bring this up, I promise. But I would like your help. There's a book called Strength to Talk, and it's a curated book of short stories. And it's real life stories of men who have found the strength to talk and share their stories to inspire other men to seek help for their mental health problems. It's not a series of stories about suicide. It's all about mental health stories and how men struggle. It's available on Amazon, but we now want to make, uh, and we know this book has saved lives because men have got in touch with us and told us it has. And it's really helped women understand what men might be going through. And more women are now contacting us than men because they want this book made into paperback so they can have it in their house so their boys can find it and possibly read it or write a message in it and then give it to their partners. So you can go and get it on Amazon, but we're desperate to get it um, uh, produced. So working with Cooper Parry, we are um, trying to raise some money to try and get that done. The book is essential because it helps break the taboo uh, of discussing mental health problems for men. Men are three times likely to commit suicide than women. And this is because they find it difficult to ask for help. The book provides a platform for men to share their stories and support others who have similar experiences. And we want to support them in make, uh, making it into a physical book. Uh, and with your help, we can raise funds. Uh, together, we can save lives. So to kind of summarize, you have to dig deep uh, into the details to succeed in business. You have to um, dig deep and help people grow and develop. You must dig deep to discover what motivates them. And finally, I said at the beginning, my goal was to give you something creative that you can all do to save a life. And we can all dig deep in ourselves to find the st uh, strength to create a space and an opportunity to check in with someone else and you can save a life. So that's me. And I'm happy to uh, take any questions to talk about what happened to me personally, talk about digging deep in business and my work uh, or digging deep in people. Um, if we can help, you know, save people's lives by digging deep, then we've done okay. And I know that we are doing that already, but if you can help me go to my LinkedIn page, my po I've got posts on there about the book and even just sharing that with companies that would like to get involved would be amazing. Thank you very much. Fab. Cool. Steve's not going to do that. No, I am around. He needs a chat. I'm around. That was... <laughs>